welcome to our second <clears throat> episode of DBAKI CV Live on ischemic heart disease. This is our monthly uh, session which we are transmitting and we hope that you utilize our social media such as YouTube or Facebook and Twitter. Um, again, I'm Dr. Alpesha. I'm an interventional cardiologist here at Houston Methodist Hospital. And today, the topic of left main revascularization. It's very appropriate in the current environment. Uh, in the last year, there has been a lot of debate. There's it's become basically become a war of the world between bypass surgery or PCI. However, this conversation has been going on for the last decade with varieties of trials. So my efforts today would be to uh, give you guys some historical perspective and bring you up to date as to where we are with left main revascularization. Uh, just uh, as an FII, uh, if you have any questions, we strongly welcome those. Uh, please use, uh, well, you can text at Debeki, uh, D-E-B-A-K-E-Y, uh, to 37607. Uh, Hopefully you can see this information on the screen. And also go online if you have poll everywhere uh, using the poll EV dot com slash debakey um, and that will allow you to uh, ask questions during our live sessions and and, uh, and we'll try and answer those questions. So again, welcome um, uh, to our uh, episode number two. So left main artery, as you all know, divides into LED and circumflex. It supplies the left side of our heart. Uh, the LED supplies the front and the circumflex supplies the lateral and the back side of our heart. Um, significant left main coronary disease, which is defined as more than 50% narrowing, is found in about 4 to 6% of all our patients who undergo coronary angiography. Most patients are symptomatic and, and at high risk of cardiovascular events. Since occlusion of this vessel compromises flow of at least 75% of the left ventricle or of the myocardium. Untreated left main stenosis has more than 20% mortality at one year. So keep that in perspective. But there are two very unique concepts of left main. One is the fact that it bifurcates into LED and circumflex. And secondly, it tends to be very high in calcification, which makes somehow, somehow the interventional approach will be tricky and requires a little bit more nuanced approach. We divide the lesions in left main based upon its location. So one is the ostial lesion, second is the uh, distal bifurcation lesion which involves the ostium of the LED and the circumflex and third is a shaft lesion which is uh, in the middle of the left main artery. Data on left main and in terms of bypass surgery has been studied quite extensively historically. It goes all the way back to the original CAS study, um, which was uh, done in 1970, published in 1970, NHLBI sponsored. And it concluded that obstructive left main disease is best treated with coronary artery bypass uh, graft compared to medical treatment. It was compared to medical therapy. And then obviously this has become the standard of care for the last 30 odd years. There have been more recent advances in coronary artery bypass surgery, such as improvements in preoperative risk assessment and management. Anesthesia has gotten better. Use of arterial graft is strongly recommended. And obviously there is improvement in postoperative care. But then to add to that, you have uh, lateral incision surgery, minimally invasive surgery, of pump bypass surgery, so on and so forth. In 2009, the ACCHA guidelines basically utilized the meta-analysis of multiple trials. And these trials had used first generation DES that it was starting to show similarity of events between PCI and cabbage at one year. And based upon that, in 2009, the guidelines had a focused update which allowed PCI of left main uh, 
to become a class 2B indication uh, or a recommendation. There have been several advances in left main PCI technique and there are varieties of factors but in my viewpoint the biggest changes have been in imaging whether it's IVAS or OCD guidance, better adjunctive pharmacology, whether it's ticagrel or prasugrel, we have gotten better at osteolesion stenting and obviously we have designed several varieties of techniques in bifurcation and trifurcation uh, lesion stenting and we'll go over some of the technical concepts in today's uh, lecture. Let's start with osteal left main PCI. So for osteal left main lesions, the specific technique to align the proximal edge to the stent with the left main osteum and you are recommended to leave about 1 to 2 millimeters of the stent into the aorta, let it little prolapse into the aorta and that is very important to avoid lesion miss. One of the commonest mistakes which often happens is that the stent misses out on the true ostium of left main which leads to very high TLR or MACE events. But there are certain very interesting ways people have developed techniques to not miss the true ostium of the left main. So for example, one of the techniques is to put a second guide wire through your guide catheter and this guide wire actually hangs out into the aorta and it allows the guide to literally stay outside the left main ostium and hence the stent can be very appropriately deployed without missing the ostium. There's a very cool technique called Zabo technique where you actually pass your second wire to the very first struts of your stent and then advance that so the wire actually allows again to have one or two millimeters of stent prolapse into the aorta and making sure that the ostium is not missed. There are catheters and devices, one of them is called Ostia Pro device which actually has anchors into the aorta. Um, so the anterior wall of the aorta basically is used as a buttress and hence the guide always stays outside and the stent can be perfectly placed. So this has allowed our osteal left main stents done very carefully. In my own practice, I very rarely use some of these secondary but very cool techniques. We usually go in with a stent and we are very comfortable leaving one to two millimeters of stent into the aorta and we strongly recommend to continue to do that along with op post, optimal post dilation. But the real challenge with left main interventions are actually in the distal part of it, in the bifurcation, often trifurcation segments. The most commonly approached technique would be what we would call provisional T-stenting. It is applied in more than half of our distal left main bifurcation uh, stents. But then 14% use the classic T-stenting. There is a word, there is a variance of it where the side branch is stented first. That is used as a T-stenting in 6%. But then there are other techniques such as modified T, Coulot technique, crush technique, Y stenting, V stenting, so on and so forth. And we'll go over some of the technical details in the next few slides. So let's start with the T stenting. In my practice, I really like T stenting, but more in a provisional manner. In other words, we need to realize to focus on the left main to LAD and also I really, really hard to ignore the circumflex ostium. Even if the circumflex ostium has 50 to 70 percent stenosis, but without any significant flow compromise, I'm not uncomfortable leaving it alone because I believe the best outcomes in bifurcation strategy is when you only have one stent with a provisional wire in your side branch. So how is this done? You basically wire both the branches and pre-dilate as you require. This is followed by a stent in the main branch, leaving a wire in the side branch, and then the stent in the main branch is deployed at high pressure while the wire is still in the side branch. And this is followed by uh, assessing the side branch, assessing the circumflex ostium. If it looks very acceptable, you are going to pull the wire 
out and uh, you are done with your stent. This is a provisional uh, bifurcation stenting which I personally favor greatly. There is a modification to that if you do end up getting a severe osteo circumflex pinch for example or is actually flow compromise because of severe plaque shift then we would recommend to recross the stand struts with a second wire try to aim for the most distal um, aspect of the circumflex ostium as much as possible this is first balloon dilated and then a second stent is advanced um, into the side branch uh, without any main branch protrusion um, and this is your T-stenting. However, it is not uncommon for us if you are not certain about the ostium, the true ostium of the circumflex is to leave a slight bit of protrusion back into the left main, what is called the tap uh, uh, technique where you are more certain that the ostium of the circumflex is covered with a drug eluting stent. This obviously technique will require final kissing balloon, we do non balloons, often we would do parts or proximal optimization in the left main portion of the stent. This is an example of T-stenting, you can see there is a severe lesion at the distal left main bifurcation, there is a 4.5 millimeter a large stent deployed from the left main into the LAD. And after that, we realized that there was a significant stenosis and plaque shift in the circumflex ostium. And this was followed by a 3.5 millimeter drug eluting stents with a short protrusion in the circumflex using the tap technique. And then you have the final results um, after a kissing balloon inflation with two non-compliant balloons. T-stenting, provisional stenting, tap techniques are very good and probably that's the reason why it is used in more than half of our cases in bifurcation. However, when you cannot clearly see the true ostium of your side branch, it is difficult to be 100% certain that you have covered it properly with a drug eluting stent. Especially when you have a narrow angle between the, between the side branch and the main branch, usually if it is less than 70 degrees, I recommend some of these other techniques. One of them is called the culotte technique. Again, you start with wiring both the branches, then you have the option of removing or leaving the wire uh, in one of the more straighter branches and deploy the stand in the more side branch or the slightly angulated branch. Then you remove the wire from the stented branch and cross a wire and a balloon into the unstented, usually the main branch. You go ahead and put a second stent into the unstented branch, so the main branch. And then you expand the stand, leaving some proximal overlap. So in the proximal portion left main, you technically have four layers of the stent. It's almost like a double barrel look there. This is followed by again recrossing uh, the stand struts and final kissing balloon inflation. And this is an example of that culotte technique where we have put in two wires. We deployed a stand in the circumflex. This is followed by a stent in the LED and then your final kiss and then you have your final angiographic result. The one which I favor a little bit more in narrow angle or difficult to assess the ostium uh, left main bifurcation is actually the mini brush uh, technique. Again, in this technique, you use both the wire uh, cross and pre-dilate those lesions. In one approach, you can do simultaneous stent placement. Usually the side branch stent is shorter and it has only slight bit of hang up in the left main. You go ahead and expand the side branch stent first to deploy that. And then once that has been deployed, you remove the balloon and after which you go ahead and deploy your main branch stent at high pressure, which allows the first three, four struts to be crushed um, with the main branch stent. Once that has been achieved, you recross with a wire uh, again from distal part of the stent uh, into the side branch. Uh, this is followed by perform performing of kissing balloon as a final inflation. And this is an example of mini crush uh, technique. Then there is this V stenting. Now it's very limited in its usage because it's not every day you find a true left main equivalent disease where there is absolute sparing of the left main 
but there is severe stenosis of by uh, both the osteas of the LAD and the circumflex. So you pose again, you cross with both wires and then you can either do simultaneous uh, stent placement or you can do one at a time. I prefer to do simultaneous like you would do an aortoiliac if you are a vascular uh, interventionalist, you would know what I'm talking about where you are doing kissing stents simultaneously um, into the left main equivalent disease segments. Um, this is an example again of a, of a nice osteal LAD and circumflex disease but sparing of the left main and you, this is an example of simultaneous uh, V stents. Then there is this technique of SKS or simultaneous kissing stent where you actually are putting both the stents literally overlapping them and quite a bit of those stents are protruding into the left main and a true double barrel anatomy is created in the left main. This is a simple quick get in and get out technique but the only time you want to use this if you are doing a left main STEMI PCI because there is very high TLR rates very high strength, strength thrombosis rates with this technique. Um, but if you have to do a quick STEMI case, this is probably one of the best approaches uh, uh, to get both the arteries nicely opened up. You can do it one at a time, but I usually would prefer simultaneous. You can see this is an SKS example of a thrombotic left main occlusive lesion, and we basically have done two simultaneous stents. So, this is a quick summary of varieties of techniques, whether it's osteum, whether it's distal bifurcation, trifurcation. And I wanted you guys give this flavor to understand why left main stenting has become so much more popular because we are able to technically do that, which was not always the case 20, 15, 20 years ago. With that in, info, with that in mind, a very important trial called Syntex came about with the first generation drug eluting stents, Texas. It uses Paclitaxel, and this was published in 2009 by Patrick Serra's group, and it was synergy between PCI with Texas and cardiac surgery. 1,800 patients were randomized to PCI with Texas versus cabbage in three vessel as well as left main disease. Out of them, out of those 1,800, 705 patients also had left main disease. Today, we'll focus on the left main disease segments to better understand the data on that. There are different subgroups divided according to the syntax score of anatomy. So low was less than 22, intermediate was 22 to 32, and high is more than 32. Syntax results at one year showed that PCI was inferior. PCI was inferior to bypass surgery for the composite primary endpoint of death, MI stroke, or unplanned revascularization. But if you look at into the details, you can clearly see that a lot of those differences was driven by very high TLR in the uh, stent group, and there was obviously slightly lower stroke in the PCI uh, group. But there was clearly a uh, inferiority of PCI compared to bypass surgery. When you start looking into the subgroups based upon the syntax score, there is something more which came to light. And this became a nice hypothesis generating um, information which were applied in future trials and we'll get to that again. So for example, when you looked at Mackey at five years by the Syntex score turtle with the highest score, more than 33, you can clearly see that bypass surgery outperforms PCI throughout. Not only MIs are significantly higher, but revascularization rates are tremendously high. That leads to a composite endpoint of death, MI, and stroke to be also statistically significant, favoring bypass surgery. When you look at the intermediate score, turtile of 23 to 32, you can see the differences are narrowing down. Revascularization rates remain still very high, um, but the differential in the death is a little bit less. However, what was exciting to the international community is this group the lowest scores with the syntax score anatomy uh, of less than 22, where death was deemed not significantly different, nor was um, the composite endpoint of death, MI, or stroke, and the revascularization rates remained a little bit higher in PCI, but again, they were uh, 
not, not exponentially higher. However, we learned that most of the differences were still driven by TLR or revascularization. So then this is 2009, first generation drug eluting stents. So the community, international community started saying, well, hold on, do we have a better stent than Texas to reduce TVR if a lot of those differences are driven by TVR? And the Syntex trial did not meet the primary endpoint of non inferior PCIs compared to surgery. But again, it was all because of higher repeat revascularization in the PCI arm. So then the question came up can we achieve at one year a MACI rate of less than 13.7%, which is comparable to bypass surgery, and a repeat revascular rates of less than 6.5%? This is the de data from the cabbage arm. So we said, well, that is our benchmark. Let's see if we can achieve that. So, as the second generation drug eluting stents came along, this is a slide of Spirit 3, and you can clearly see that the MACE event rates are significantly lower in Zion's stent, which is our second generation Everolimus uh, stent, compared to Texas. Not only that, the TLR rates are also significantly lower, and at three year TLR rates is 5.4% in Zion's and only 3.3% at one year. So these are very encouraging data saying, ha, huh, maybe the second generation drug eluting stand ought to be used. So this led to this time period where we were saying, well, if you got left main disease, is it always bypass surgery? Because we felt as interventionalists that maybe we can do this very safely, maybe even through radials. However, the patient who was in the middle said, well, let's come up with more data. And we, this led to the new trial called Excel. Excel enrolled about 2,900 patients with unprotected left main disease and a syntax score of less than 32. Uh, there was a consensus agreement of eligibility as well as equipoise by the heart team. So surgeons as well as cardio interventional cardiologists had to review the case and have to establish equipoise. And out of them, about 1,900 qualified, about 1,000 who did not qualify were made part of a registry, but the randomized controlled trial used 950 patients in the PCI with Zions and bypass surgery, and their follow-ups and primary endpoints was uh, measured at median of three year follow-up and minimum of, of at least two years. The major inclusion criteria was unprotected left main coronary artery disease with more than 70% diameter stenosis or 50 to 70% with either non-invasive evidence of left main ischemia or IVAS MLA less than six millimeter square or FFR less than 0 0.80. Again, as I said, syntax score was on, has to be less than 32 in terms of other concomitant disease and clinical and anatomic eligibility for both PCI and cabbage as agreed by the local heart team. The protocol procedures, some of the nuances, the PCI recommendations uh, that complete revascularization of all ischemic territories with EES or Zion stents. Provisional left main bifurcation was a treatment preferred, as I said. It has the lowest amount of TLR compared to all the bifurcation techniques. IVAS guidance was strongly recommended, uh, it was not mandatory. DAPT preloading and treatment for one year was recommended and routine angiographic follow-up was not permitted and not recommended, which is very interesting because before 2009, it was a class 2 a recommendation if you were to do a left main stand to do a routine follow-up angiography at six months, three to six months. So this was a big step going forward because as you know, the more angiogram, angiograms do you do after a stand, you find reasons to go after some of those lesions which may not be clinically that relevant. Cabbage recommendations where they had to be performed with or without uh, pulmonary bypass, they were up to the operator's discretion. There is complete anatomic revascularization of all vessels, more than 1.5 millimeters in diameter with more than 50% diameter stenosis. Arterial grafts were strongly recommended, epiotic ultrasound and TE were recommended, and clopidogrel use during follow up allowed, but again, not mandatory. And obviously, both the groups received guideline directed medical therapy. So, the primary and the hierarchical secondary clinical outcomes are as follows. In the PCI, the MACE of death stroke and MI at three years was observed in 15.4% versus 14.7% in coronary artery bypass surgery, which gave a p-value of non-inferiority of 
Uh, death stroke and MI at 30 days, again, was 4.9% in PCI and 7.9% in bypass surgery, which is not unexpected given the early uh, events uh, in the first 30 days after bypass surgery. But again, the P non-inferiority favored uh, PCI here. Um, death stroke MI or ischemia-driven uh, revascularization at three years was higher in PCI at 23% and bypass surgery was 19% with a P of non-inferiority of 0.01 and death stroke and MI at three years again was 15.4 versus 14.7% with a hazard ratio of 1.00. The primary endpoint as I just described um, showed there was a higher event rates in bypass surgery up front but then gradually as you followed those patients over the next two and three years there was stabilizing of uh, events um, later on in those bypass surgery patients. But interestingly, we continue to see a slight event rates accumulating in the stent arm. And right at about three years, you kind of get that alarming sense of a crisscross of the grafts, which are very unsettling if you're an interventional cardiologist as to what happens after three years. Adjudicated outcomes at 30 days, um, again, um, death, Stroke um, were no different. Stroke was slightly higher in bypass surgery group. MI was definitely higher uh, at 30 days in the coronary artery bypass surgery group. Um, strength thrombosis obviously was uh, noted at 0.6% and up to 30 days. Um, and graft occlusion was noted about 1.2% at 30 days um, uh, in, in those uh, first initial data. The adjudicated outcomes at three years, which I think are very, very interesting, shows that when you divide the death events, which was 8.2% in PCI versus 5.9% in bypass group, the definitive cardiovascular death was equivalent or equal almost in both the groups. Non-cardiovascular was a little bit higher, 3.9% versus 2.3% in bypass group. And obviously there is that undetermined uh, small population as well. Stroke was slightly, remained slightly higher in the bypass, but again was not different. There was a little late catch up on the stroke. In PCI, we do not understand why, but it could be just a coexisting cerebrovascular disease. And MI, periprocedural, was again a little bit higher with uh, bypass surgery, and spontaneous was a little bit higher in PCI. Again, this is all at uh, three year group. However, what was interesting was that most of the STEMIs. Um, were a little bit higher in the bypass surgery group versus in the PCI group. Again, those are very uh, secondary endpoints with adjudicated outcomes up to three years. Interesting observations. What about, uh, again, when we go through the death and the, uh, and the modes of death, it's very important to dig this a little bit deeper because in the definite cardiovascular death, which was, again, not much different between the two groups, myocardial infarction and sudden uh, was no different. Sudden cardiac death was a little bit higher in PCI group, but stroke, bleeding, and other cardiovascular causes, again, were not that different. Now, amongst the other non-cardiovascular uh, deaths, the only thing which was different was infection, but the, all the other causes of death remained uh, uh, sort of similar. At three years, some of the other adjudicated outcomes, for example, ischemia-driven uh, IDR, revascularization, uh, was significantly higher at 12% versus 7% in bypass surgery. Now, remember, this is still much better than what we saw in Syntex original trial, but still much higher at three years in PCI group. Um, all revascularization remained high through those three years. Stent thrombosis, again, was observed at 1.3%. Uh, in those patients up to three years, um, and graft occlusion was noted to be about 5.4% um, up to uh, three years. What was also interesting is when you assess uh, uh, angina um, and follow those patients, there was no dissimilarity between those two groups in terms of symptom relief or symptom improvement. They both had equal amount of sustained benefit throughout those three years. So in conclusions, Excel was able to state that treatment of patients with left-hand coronary artery disease with low or intermediate syntax scores with a 
second generation cobalt chromium Evralimus eluting stands, aka Zions, resulted in similar rates of primary endpoint of death, stroke, or MI at three years with fewer adverse events within 30 days compared to bypass surgery. PCI may thus be considered an acceptable or even preferred revascularization modality for selected patients with left main coronary artery decision, a decision which should be made after heart team discussion, taking into account each patient's individual circumstances and preferences. Based upon this, in 2014, the European guidelines was able to make some significant changes in their uh, left main revascularization algorithm. Again, um, left main disease with any syntax score, bypass surgery remained class 1. However, with a low syntax score, it was allowed to be made class 1 and as intermediate syntax score, it was allowed to be made class 2A, but again with excessively high complex anatomy and syntax score more than 32, it was class 3. ACCHA guidelines were to follow, but this has created significant amount of debate in our field. So this is three years data on Excel, but then let's try to move on to 2019. This is when now uh, the five-year data comes out. Remember we talked about how the uh, graphs of the outcomes of maize were trying to crisscross. So let's see what happens at five years. Well, as at five years, now you have uh, a slight favoring data in terms of cabbage where the total maize event rates was only 19.2% 19 .2 and the PCI had increased to about 22%. So again, this goes to show that there is a definite slight continuing increase in events in PCI group as years go by. Interestingly, the p-value is only 0.13 with a uh, odds ratio of 1.19. So what are the primary endpoints at five years? Well, well, well so how is it different? Um, so let's kind of revisit some of those events. Um, in the cardiovascular events, uh, death, as I said, was slightly higher at 13% uh, versus 9.9% um, in the cabbage group. Um, so the odds ratio is 1.38 and an absolute difference of 3.1%. However, when you look at the uh, details of the causality of death, the definite cardiovascular, the delta was only 0.5%, obviously favoring bypass surgery, but only 0.5% are definitive cardiovascular death. Undetermined causes remain the larger significant difference of 0.9%. Uh, cerebrovascular events such as stroke was again slightly higher um, in, in the cabbage group myocardial infarction, which is again very um, uh, interesting data because it has created a lot of controversy, but myocardial infarction was 10.6% in the PCI group at 5 years and 9.1% in cabbage group at 5 years with a delta of 1.4% favoring bypass surgery. Not a big number. I mean, you're talking about an odds ratio of 1.14. So MI is not that huge a difference at this point. And again, periprocedural MIs, where, which we were seeing up front during bypass surgery, remained the, the big driving force for the cabbage MIs. The non-periprocedural MIs were higher in the PCI group um, by about 3.2%. What about revascularizations? About five years, we saw revascularization rates of 16.9%. Uh, in the PCI group versus 10% in the cabbage group with a delta of 6.9%. So, beyond the science, what are the Excel controversies? So, now we are in 2020 and this has led to a uh, couple of hotly debated uh, controversies. Uh, so, number one is... Uh, is mortality greater after PCI compared with cabbage and left main disease? And if so, doesn't that trump all? I mean, isn't mortality should be the only driver of uh, hard out and endpoints? Um, and second, why was a specific uh, protocol uh, definition of MI selected in the Excel um, data analysis for MI uh, 
versus the universal definition, um, the third universal definition, uh, which was published before uh, before that. So why, why, why was that not utilized and why did the Excel investigators come up with their own protocol definition of MI? So let's first talk about the mortality. As I said a little bit earlier, the observed difference in mortality was modest. The delta is only 3% over five years. That's about 0.6% per year. So you're talking about 87% in PCI versus 90% in cabbage survival at five years. I mean, you, you can take your pick as to what that means to your patients, but again, the fact remained that delta was only 3% at five years. Also, mortality was an underpowered exploratory endpoint. It was not specified for hypothesis testing. It was one of those more than 35 non-powered secondary endpoints. So it is not adjusted for its multiplicity. There's nearly identical cardiovascular death consistent with similar five-year all MI rates, which I think is very interesting observation. And the difference is driven by non-cardiovascular deaths, primarily late infections and cancer. So is the observed mortality difference in Excel real? That is the truth. To improve precision for low frequency outcomes such as death, MI, stroke, we must look at all high quality RCD data. So in this last decade or so, uh, we have come up with four large left main drug eluting stand versus bypass surgery trials. And um, this was published in circulation in 2014. Um, and it's interesting, uh, when you put all, all of them together, it amounts to almost four, well, it amounts to more than 4,000 patients who have gone through this uh, randomized uh, trial. But what is very interesting is there is really not much of a difference between mortality. So you look at syntax, 14, again, every, all of them do favor um, well, they don't always, but uh, there's, there's li literally an overlap. But in syntax, the mortality was actually observed to be a little bit higher in cabbage at 14.6% versus 12.8% with PCI. In pre-combat, it was 7.9% for cabbage and 5.7% for PCI. In Excel, as we talked about, about 1,900 patients the PCI group had 13% and cabbage was 9.9%. And the NOBLE trial, which we didn't talk much about today, but also an impo equally important trial, the mortality was not much different and PCI group was 9.4% versus 8.7% in cabbage. So it does raise interesting questions. I mean, if mortality is something which is gonna drive our decisions, in revascularization of left main, you got four large randomized control trials with more than 4,000 patients. And yeah, maybe there are some subtle numerical differences, but again, at five years, there's not, not a whole lot of delta in the outcome. So what is even impressive is Syntex, the original trial, while well, we actually have this data published in Lancet last year in 2019, up to 10 years. So we have follow up up to 10 years on those syntax left main patients. And look at this, the cabbage group actually has 26.7% and PCI group has 26.1% mortality in those patients. I find this one of the strongest slides in terms of saying, well, we are not providing a non-inferior service to a patient with left main by offering them PCI. Now, what is also interesting, and again, this is hypothesis generating, is that at 10 years, actually the syntax score also didn't make a whole lot of difference in terms of mortality. So then the second controversy is regarding uh, the MI uh, on, on the Excel. I think as we get into this, I, I want to clarify for our listeners how the MI is defined. So for example, the type 4A, which is the post-PCI MI, uh, 
it is arbitrarily defined by elevation of troponin times 5. This is again the third universal definition. This is what uh, the original sky definition, uh, third universal definition. Troponin of more than times 5, which is 99 percentile in patients with normal baseline val values, that's one. So, you, you know, you're normal, then your troponin goes more, more than five times, that's an MI. Or it may be abnormal to begin with before the PCI, but then there is an in increase of more than 20% um, uh, of the numbers. But plus, either symptoms, so changes of troponin by 20% plus symptoms is an MI in PCI group. Or new ischemic changes, but not Q waves, ischemic changes. But you can have just symptoms and troponin increase, and you can still deem that as a post PCI MI. But new ischemic changes or new left bundle branch block, or angiographic loss of patency of a major coronary artery or a side branch. So, not just of the stent, but even a side branch occlusion, or persistent slow or no reflow of embolization or imaging, imaging demonstration of new loss of viable myocardium or new regional wall motion abnormalities. Now compare this with your post cabbage definitions. Again, this is the original third universal definition of MI. This was not ut utilized in Excel. Type 5 or post cabbage is MI is again arbitrarily defined by elevation of biomarkers more than 10 times in patients with normal baseline values. So, they do not allow. So, if the patient has abnormal baseline values, they will not be classified as post cabbage MI irrespective of what numbers you get post cabbage. So, they have to have normal baseline values for them to be considered MI plus either new Q waves, not just EKG changes or symptoms, you got to have Q waves or a left bundle branch block or angiographic documented new graft or new native coronary artery occlusion angiographic occlusion, not of a side branch, not just slow flow, or imaging demonstration of new loss of viable myocardium or new region of wall motion abnormalities. So, think about it. It is harder to prove post cabbage MI than it is to prove post PCI MI based upon the third universal definition. So, so there are certain issues, right, that are ascertainment and other biases. So, must have normal biomarkers level for post cabbage MI as I said, I mean so the pre, pre cabbage MI, uh, pre cabbage biomarkers have to be normal for them to be considered, but that is not true for post PCI MI. Symptoms are a criteria, but not for P post PCI, but not for post cabbage. Ischemic EKG changes are required post PCI, but for post cabbage you have to have Q waves or a new left bundle branch block. And geography is performed in 100% of PCI because we are doing it, we are looking at it, we see side branch occlusions, we see no flow, slow flow, but it is rare after bypass surgery and even then the angiographic requirement is much more rigorous after cabbage than PCI. So those are some of the issues. They are ascertainment, they are biases, but they are inherent to how we define MI. So because of this, Excel protocol defined post-procedural MI slightly different and this is a crux of the debate. And, and the divide between the surgeons and the interventional cardiologists as the Excel data gets uh, uh, assessed. So, how did Excel define protocol uh, peripostal MI? So, peripostal MI was defined after both PCI and cabbage. They are the same, more than 10 times uh, the upper limit of peak CPK uh, MB elevation within 72 hours, more than 10 times, or more than 5 times plus at least one of the following such as new pathological Q waves in at least two contiguous leads or a new persistent non-related left bundle, not rate related left bundle branch block, uh, angiographically documented graft or native coronary artery occlusion or with new severe stenosis with thrombosis and diminished epicardial flow or imaging evidence of new loss of viable myocardium or new regional wall motion abnormalities. But the crux of the matter is A, it, it has basically made it the same, whether you go through bypass surgery or PCI and, and again, um, the, it, it is controversial, uh, but it does take up a lot of guesswork and some of the inherent inbuilt bias from uh, how we assert an MI and what do we mean. So, for example, this is evidence based, this is not arbitrary. These threshold levels of CKMB represent large MIs 
that have been independently associated with death after both PCI and cabbage. Identical thresholds for PCI and cabbage, so they are consistent with the literature. Same additional criteria used to minimize ascertainment and other biases. Definition were developed and agreed by a large group of surgeons and ICs, equal numbers after detailed literature reviews before the sky definition, uh, the third universal definition, and differs from the sky definition. So that is the rebuttal from the Excel investigators from the international community why this is a better way of assessing periprocedural um, MIs. So where does all this data, where does all these trials leave us today? Leftman PCI versus coronary artery bypass surgery. It remains a hard time discussion. They are very, two very different approaches. On PCI, you got the early advantages. It been less in, invasive. There are fewer periprocedural complications such as stroke, MI, atrial fibrillation, bleeding, acute kidney injury, uh, etc. There are so many of those. Lower 30-day MACE. Initially, it always outperforms bypass surgery. There is more rapid recovery with better early quality of life and earlier angina relief. Cabbage, on the other hand, bypass surgery, on the other hand, has later advantages. It is more durable. There are fewer adverse events beyond 30 days, particularly MI and repeat revascularization procedures. So when you try to weigh PCI and cabbage, at least based upon all the data, but especially from Excel or even Syntex 10-year data, I would like to suggest that there is no significant major difference in long-term survival, MACE, which includes death MI stroke, or quality of life in both of those two approaches. Thank you very much. I appreciate our attention. And we plan to meet um, next month with another a new topic. And uh, Please utilize our um, online uh, media resources um, to look through our uh, uh, presentation today. And again, if you have any questions, uh, please forward it to us. Thank you very much.